Hello, everyone, and welcome to phylloseminar.org. The current theme is on machine learning approaches to phylogenetics, and this is the second talk in a series of three talks on that topic. Please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions. Today's speaker is Siavash Mirarab. Siavash is an associate professor at UCSD, working on method development for various uh, areas relating to phylogenetics. Before his current position, he finished his PhD with Tandy Werno at UT Austin, working on phylogenomic, multiple sequence alignment, and microbiome analyses. His lab works on species tree inference, phylogenetic placement with applications to biodiversity research, methods for analyzing microbiome data, and HIV transmission reconstruction. Welcome, Siavash, and thank you for participating. Uh, thanks very for that introduction. So I'm going to talk about uh, you know, distance-based phylogenetics, something that is not in fashion anymore, but I think uh, you know, its combination with machine learning uh, leads to some interesting directions to explore. The work that I'm going to talk about are the work of two PhD students in my lab, Mithin Balaban and Yu Jian, and, and we have some collaborators I'll mention at the end. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about phylogenetic placement. Um, you know, everyone knows what's the novel phylogenetic reconstruction. You have your sequences, you do some inference, you get a tree. Uh, phylogenetic placement is where you have a bunch of sequences for which you already have a tree. We are going to call those reference sequences or backbone sequences. And you have some new sequences, query sequences. You want to know where on the tree they, um, they belong. So the placement is basically just addition of these new qu queries onto the existing trees. Usually the way it's done, uh, we do not uh, try to infer the relationship between queries. So if what if query two, the correct placement for query two was on this Q1 branch, we would have just uh, you know placed it on that uh, base branch uh, instead of uh, adding it to Q2. So they are, the queries are uh, placed uh, independently usually. Now, placement is not a new problem. You know, if you go back to 69, there were, you know, initially people were using phylogenetic placement as part of a, like a greedy algorithm to build a tree. You, smart, uh, you start with a small tree and you just add sequences one by one. But uh, since around 2007, 2008, there has been a much stronger interest in phylogenetic pr placement because of its application to microbiome analysis. And so one of the earlier papers in this area came from PeerWorks uh, lab where they basically suggested this pipeline where, okay, so for, in microbiome analysis, you have sequences, you don't know what the species these sequences belong to. It might be a mixture of different species and you wanna know what they are, right? So you can basically find marker genes among your sequences, align them to, a set, uh, to an alignment of reference sequences that you have. Once you have that alignment, you can look for the uh, you know, best placement on your reference tree. And these placements on the tree tell you something about what is uh, making up your sample, what is species. So for example, they showed this figure where for uh, you know, soil and various water samples, they were able to distinguish what parts of the tree of life are to be found in those samples. So this, this kind of application is what many people think about. Now, uh, in microbiome right now, uh, Phylogenetic is used pervasively in all sorts of applications. Part of it is just what I talked about, you know, what the species do you have in a, um, uh, you know, in a sample, but people use it also to do functional analysis. And, you know, if you have a large number of samples, once you do phylogenetic placement, you can compare two samples in terms of the phylogenetics using methods like Unifrag or uh, you know, Edge uh, PCA and build figures like this that tells you, you know, how these samples relate to each other. Uh, there are many more applications if anyone is interested. Eric has uh, a very nice um, uh, review of uh, you know, connections of phylogenetics and uh, microbiome in CISPIRE. Okay, so I mean, and then microbiome is not actually the only uh, uh, application right now. You know, people have been thinking about how to apply uh, phylogenetic placement for understanding COVID, uh, 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 you know, uh, a spread, for example. You can look and try to see, you know, where, uh, which is the strain that has infected the leader of your country. If you are interested in that question, uh, phylogenetic placement can help you as well. Uh, okay, so what are, so from algorithmic perspective, 
placement gives us two benefits from my perspective. One is the scalability. That's the sort of obvious one. You're not redoing the backbone tree. You're saving time. Also, you place queries independently, which means you have running times that increase linearly with increased number of uh, queries. That's great. And also, it gives you sort of embarrassing parallelism in the sense that you can just uh, work on queries independently from one another. So all of that is great. Uh, probably a little bit less appreciated is that it also gives you uh, error tolerance. And what I mean by that is that you know, the query sequences that we want to place oftentimes are error prone and they have missing data, maybe they're fragmentary. If that's the kind of data you're dealing with, if you were to include those sequences in your uh, in your uh, inference and just do a de novo uh, inference of the entire tree, these sequences can sort of impact your uh, the topology of the references and not necessarily for the better, right? So they can sort of reduce the accuracy of the entire tree. But when you just place them on the existing tree, at least that backbone is solid. And, and you can actually see this on microbiome data. This paper that we published in 2019 showed that your know, placement sometimes gives you more meaningful results than if you do de novo for these fragmentary sequences. Of course, the shortcomings are just like the flip side of all these benefits. If you, you know, when, when you do placement, you don't get relationship between sequences and you don't allow the, uh, the relationship between the backbone to change. So if you do have very nice signal in the queries, that's you know, something you're missing. It's just like a trade-off, basically. But, but really, the reason we, want, we are interested in it is a scalability. There have been, you know, since around 2010, there has been a lot of, uh, sort of uh, method development for placement. It was really pioneered by uh, Eric's group, Eric Madsen's group, and uh, also Alexis Estamantakis. Uh, two methods came out, pplacer and EPA, they, uh, that do maximum likelihood placement. They find the place on the tree with the best likelihood. And both of these methods were very effective. And so they also inspired a lot of work in this area. You know, uh, other people developed faster methods, uh, alternatives to pplacer and EPA. And there have been a lot of methods that were developed for sort of pre-processing or post-processing of the results of the placement, you know, things like doing alignment or comparing, you know, uh, trees with placement to, uh, uh, you know, so post and post, uh, pre and post processing. Now, um, why do we even need placement when we want to do, let's say, microbiome analysis? Uh, why can't we just find the closest you know, just compare our query sequence to everything in the reference and find find the closest match. Uh, you know, blast it if you like. And the answer is, you know, these two pictures hopefully uh, help. You know, let's say this is your query and it's sister to a large group of things that are more or less the same distance to your query. If you know, there is the, this is the correct placement for your query. It's a novel query. It's not very much similar to anything uh, that you have. And if you were to place this query by closest match, you would you would probably just choose one of these arbitrarily, more or less, and that would be incorrect. Another example is this sort of Felsenstein zone, like trees, where uh, where you have your query, the closest thing to it in terms of the uh, uh, in, in terms of the distance, in terms of sequence distance, is different from the closest thing to it in terms of the phylogenic relationship, just because the rates of evolution are not uniform. OK, so in practice, what does this mean? We took this RNA, uh, RNA, data, sim, uh, RNA sim data set that uh, uh, Kim's lab had uh, simulated. This data set is like a million sequences. We just uh, subsampled the million sequences down to 200, 100,000, 200,000, 100,000, all the way down to 500. So, as you go from the left to right, it's the same tree with better taxon sampling. And we just asked ourselves if you choose the closest, so we left out some of the species as queries, and then we try to insert them back just by uh, you know, finding the closest match. And what you see is that between 50 to 60% of the time, you find the correct placement, but the rest of the time, uh, you are misled. And then you can ask yourself, well, if that's maybe you can't do any better, you know, this is a huge tree. And the answer is no, you can do better if you use maximum likelihood uh, placement. So 
The two methods I mentioned, PPLACER and EPA-NG, which is the next generation of EPA, uh, these maximum likelihood methods do far better than just placing on closest match. And for what is worth, PPLACER is actually quite a bit more accurate in our tests than uh, EPA-NG. The issue is that when the reference tree size keeps growing, um, these methods at some point stop to be uh, applicable. For various reasons, it has to do with numerical issues, sometimes memory, sometimes running time, but you can't really run them when your backbone tree is like 200,000 sequences. But if you could run it to the extent that you can, you see that as the uh, backbone tree gets denser, you do get better and better accuracy. So taxon sampling helps. No, no one should be surprised by how, like the fact that better taxon sampling gives you better accuracy. Uh, the question is whether we can benefit from taxon sampling. And part of that is just having large data sets. And in the field of microbiome, at least, we do have very large data sets. So if you're only working on 16S, data sets, you know, trees that have hundreds of thousands of sequences have been around for a long time. If they're not even new, these days you can probably get trees with millions of sequences for 16S. If you're uh, working on metagenomic data where, you know, the leaves are genomes, uh, we published the tree uh, two years ago uh, with 10,000 uh, genomes uh, uh, inferred using 380 genes. There's also, also GTDB where they have a tree with 20,000 bacteria with, um, I forgot how many genes, I think 100 genes or something like that. So these very large data sets exist and they're gonna just grow. I, I, can, I can guarantee in the next couple of years, they're gonna be even bigger reference trees that you know we have hundreds of thousands of uh, genomes in RefSeq right now. Okay, so what maximum likelihood placement is not enabling us to do yet is to place on these very large trees. So it, it scalability is a bit limited, at least the way it has been done right now, maybe that can improve in future. Um, the other issue is that, that cannot be improved is that when you do maximum likelihood placement, what you need is an alignment as input. And uh, I'll talk about this later. There are some applications where you don't have the line sequences, not for the backbone, not for the, uh, uh, and you don't even have like assembled sequences for the references. So alignment not only is difficult, it's, it's actually impossible. Uh, so that's a kind of scenario where maximum likelihood placement cannot even be applied. It's not a question of the scalability. So there are there is room for alternative to maximum uh, likelihood placement. And the alternative that we came up with was to go back to distance-based phylogenetics. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with what distance-based phylogenetics is. Uh, I'll just mention how it would be done for uh, placement problems. So you have your query sequences, you have your uh, reference sequences, that's your input. What you do is you compute the distance, sequence distance between your, se your sequence and your um, references. You get a vector of distances. And, and you phylogenetically correct those distances. For example, you can do, use the very simple Joule scatter correction. It's just like a little equation. You apply it, you get distances that are phylogenetically correct, uh, corrected. Then um, now uh, here's the thing. If I, I have a reference tree, if I was to add my query anywhere on the reference tree, it would also imply a vector of distances. These are now three distances, right? So just the path lengths between you know, your query and every sequence. Okay, so I have uh, sequence-based distances. I have three basic uh, distances. And my objective is to minimize the divergence between these two vectors, right? So I want to find the placement that would give me, uh, that, you know, this the vector of distances is fixed. The vector of three distances depends on the placement. I want the placement that minimizes that vector, right? So this is the equation we are trying to minimize, finding the placement with minimum distances to the backbone or n backbone sequences. Um, and um, what we were, and you, you know, we have this weight also here. I'll talk about this weight uh, uh, in a second. What we were able to do was to find the algorithm that solved this problem in time that grows linearly with n, the size of your reference 
tree using dynamic programming. If you were to solve this problem sort of in the naive way, basically look at every branch and optimize this, uh, this function, uh, you can convince yourself that would be quadratic time. But there is a way to do it in linear time with dynamic programming, and that was sort of our algorithmic uh, contribution here. Um, now, so what's the benefit here? The one benefit is uh, you know distance space, so it can be fast. We will see that in a second. The other benefit is that as long as you have these distances, whether it, uh, you can you can do placement, and sometimes you can uh, estimate distances without alignments or even assemblies. And, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. Okay, so one problem that uh, many of you might be thinking about is what do you do with very divergent taxa, right? Everyone knows uh, distance space phylogenetics. You know, one of the reasons it hasn't been as accurate as things like maximum likelihood is that computing large distances is difficult. Uh, uh, computing them accurately is very difficult, right? You can have a lot of variance around. And there are two solutions we use. In the first version of Apple that we published, we use a weighting scheme. That's kind of the standard app approach. We use the Fitch and Margolis FM weighting. Basically, you just downweight the long distances in, in this uh, optimization problem, as, as you can see right here. You are trying to sort of take out their variance. Um, the other approach that we have now developed in an uh, updated version of Apple called Apples 2 is using divide and conquer. So if you have a large tree, you can divide it into smaller subsets. And you can try to figure out which subset your query belongs to and then compute distances only in that subset. This improves running time. It improves accuracy. This kind of divide and conquer heuristic is not new. It's something that maximum likelihood placement methods also use. OK, so we are going to, so let's look at some results. This is the simulation I showed you earlier, right, increasing taxon sampling. And now we have apples and apples two added to that picture. You can see that apples is right about where EPA and G is in terms of accuracy. You know, the older version was a slightly less accurate. The new version is a slightly more accurate. It's, it's around the same level of accuracy. It's not quite uh, as accurate as key placer yet, but it's, it's, it's getting close. Now, the actual benefit is that you can now go to these very large backbone trees, and uh, as you expect, as the backbone tree gets denser and denser, because of it, better taxon sampling, you get better accuracy. In terms of running time and memory, Apples 2 is far faster than uh, existing methods. You know, this is per one query, and it's also uh, used, it uses a fraction of the memory. So on 200,000 species, we can do placement with you know, one or two gigabytes of memory. Uh, the slope of these, that these are log log plots, the slope of these lines show you uh, sort of the uh, asymptotic growth of the uh, running time or memory. And it's actually sublinear, that's, that's by design. Because of this divide and conquer technique I talked about, you can get sublinear uh, running time uh, 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 increase. OK, so that's sort of just like a simulation uh, result to show that the method works. Now let's apply it to that alignment-free, assembly-free uh, kind of uh, situation I described earlier. Let me just motivate it first. So there is this technique called genome skimming, which is uh, a way of doing uh, uh, basically sample identification, but not necessarily for bacteria. For It's basically similar to uh, uh, sample identification for mic microbes, but this is what you would use for eukaryotes, right? So let's say you have, I don't know, a butterfly. You want to know which species of butterfly it is. The traditional way to do is that is barcoding. You, you take the CO1 gene uh, and, and sequence that. And that gives you some resolution. The method that has emerged uh, in the past decade as alternative is doing sort of shotgun sequencing of the entire genome, but at very low coverage. Because, because you don't sort of want to spend a lot of money to do sample identification, right? So maybe for $50 or so, you can get one, two X coverage of the genome. When you have such low coverage, this is what we call a genome skimming. When you have such low coverage, you can't assemble it. You, so you just have the reads. Now, if you had all the reference species assembled, you could just you know, align the reads to do those references and figure out which one is the closest. 
but also you can imagine that your references are also genome schemes. And in that case, you can't even align reads to genome, right? So what you're left with is basically like a bag of reads that is your barcode. And uh, to, to identify if the, is this your barcode of, of the reference and the query, they are all represented by bags of reads. And what you want to be able to do is to compute distances between bags of reads. If you can compute distances between bags of reads, then you can do apples placement. But you want to compute these distances even when the coverage is low. And, and, and you can do that. That can be done using sort of tamer based approaches. Uh, at least, uh, you know, if the distance is very high, I don't know, 40% or so, maybe not. But if the distances are within like 20, 25, you know, less than 25% uh, or so, it can be done with decent accuracy. We published this method called the skimmer for this problem. So you have your references, you have your query, you do some pre-processing. This is, you know, getting k and profiles of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the genome scale. Once you do this pre-processing, you can run um, all of uh, these through a skimmer and we'll, it will estimate the distances for you. And then you can use apples to place your bag of read query uh, on the reference, on uh, the reference tree. We tested this kind of pipeline on uh, three different data sets of genome skins. Some of them are real genome skins, some of them are simulated genome skins. And we asked ourselves, if you compute this eschimer distances and then you feed them to apples, how much uh, accuracy you have, what percentage of times are you finding the wrong placement on the tree uh, compared to if you just use this eschimer distances and do uh, your know, closest placement? And we see that the, uh, uh, you know, most of the time we are finding the correct placement fit for these two data sets, for the fruit fly, they just said, you know, 30% of the, uh, for Drosophila, we 30% of the time finding the wrong placement, but when we find the wrong placement, uh, we are off by one edge. Uh, now, these trees are not super large. They have like tens of species in them, uh, but, uh, you know, one branch off is not too bad. Uh, so, so, so this works. You can compare, you can do placement without assembly, without alignment, just based on k mer distances. Uh, okay, so uh, so setting that application aside, now let's go back to what we started with, which was uh, microbiome analysis, in particular for metagenomics. If you have metagenomic reads, right, so you have reads that you got from shotgun sequencing from a collection of multiple uh, bacteria, what can you do? How can you use placement? Uh, you, you, can you use all reads? It's not so clear. How, how can you uh, aggregate reads across the genome? Yeah, there are various solutions out there, two of them that I'll mention. One is to have some marker genes, find reads from the marker genes, align the reads to the marker genes, and then the placement based on reads alone. That's one approach, for example. We have developed a method called PIP for this. Other people have uh, similar methods. Another approach is, uh, uh, Another approach is to do uh, assembly. So you take your uh, uh, set of reads, you do uh, metagenomic assembly, you get mags, metagenomic assembled, uh, metagenome assembled uh, genomes. And, uh, and then you look for full length marker genes in the assembly and, and you align those and place those. This second approach is what we want to test with apples to see if it works well. So to test that, we took that reference tree of 10,000 microbial species. So this is a tree that was inferred using Astral from 380 marker genes of 10,000 species. And we took this tree, we left out from it 200 species as queries. So we chose these queries to be uh, not so distant uh, to, to uh, not, I'm sorry, not so similar to any of the other queries. So these are not like easy queries. We, we took those out of the tree and we simulated uh, your reads from them. We assembled these reads to get a scaffold. Then we looked for our 381 marker genes in these scaffolds. And for each scaffold, whatever marker genes we found, we just concatenated them. And uh, we gave that to apples as input 
for placement, right? So the input is concatenation of some number of genes between one and 381. And what we measure is, uh, you know, we have removed these sequences from the tree, so we can, these genomes from the tree, so we can see how close are we getting to the position that we had gotten in the original tree with this very simple approach, right? So the position in the original tree is based on this very sort of complex pipeline of gene trees, the species trees, uh, you know, maximum likelihood for each gene tree. It's a very complex pipeline. Here we are just, you know, using distances to place. Now, what we see is the results shown down here. On the x-axis, you have the number of marker genes that you were, it, we were able to find in a scaffold. Some scaffolds have more marker genes, some of them have more. And the y-axis, we have error. How far are we from the correct placement? On a tree of 10,000 species, an, an error of 20 edge is very high. You have to think like in logarithmic terms, right? So 20 edges away from the correct placement is not good at all, right? Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, so, so th these, these are not such a such great placement. Now, once you get to a place where you have 20 marker genes or, or more, then, uh, then what, uh, what you have is a rapid uh, reduction in error. By the time you get to a place where you have 40 or 50 marker genes, in your sample, as in your scaffold, uh, you have very good placement, right? Uh, so, so you do need a large number of genes, what I would call a large number of genes to get uh, high accuracy. Okay, so this is, this is interesting, but this, uh, uh, you know, there are two questions here. Why is, why do we need so many marker genes, right? Yeah, we are used to looking at 16S and trying to identify a species with that. Why do we need 4D marker genes? Uh, the, conceptually, the answer is gene tree discordance, right? I, uh, yeah, I hope everyone, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone knows, you know, as you go across the genome, the evolutionary history, the true evolutionary history can change from one place to another. So you have to think about the species tree and gene tree. Each gene is evolving on a gene tree that might be different from the species tree. Here we are trying, we are attempting to place on the species tree. If you have only one gene or two genes, because these trees are different, it's maybe not so surprising that you have incorrect placement. Another thing is that you know, the more genes you have, of course, this, the stronger your signal, you have more data. In terms of bacteria, which is what we are studying here, horizontal gene transfer is probably the main reason for these discordances, but there are other reasons that are important uh, as well. Okay, so you know, just back to this result over here, uh, you know, if you stare at this enough, you, you, are, you, are, you wind up with the pressing question. Is it really necessary, necessary to have these many genes to get good placement on the species tree? Can we do better than this? And, and so this is, this is sort of the extreme version of the question I just mentioned. If you have a single gene, data from a single gene, but you also have a species tree, can you use the data from that single gene to do placement on the species tree? Not on the gene tree, but on the species tree. Now, why is this, is this just like a cu uh, curious question? I would argue no. I would argue this is a question we have always been trying to answer, but we have been avoiding it. So. You know, when, for example, you take 16S uh, sequences and you use that for sample identification, or you take CO1 marker gene and you do sample identification, you don't use those genes because you are interested in the evolution of 16S or CO1. You use them because you think their evolution is close enough to the species tree, so you want to do a species identification, you use them. So really, it's sort of... Um, uh, the actual question we are trying to answer is this, but we answer a different question. We place on the gene tree. If we were able to answer this question, I think it's, it's actually a more direct response to the question we want to answer, but also it has other benefits. For example, we can take our 16S data that are you know, pervasive in micro, uh, microbiome analysis and metagenomic data, add everything onto this same tree and once every, uh, everything is added to the same tree, you can do all sorts of sort of unified analysis on the combined results. 
So there's some practical reasons to do this as well. Now, uh, what is the challenge? Why can't we just like feed the species tree to maximum likelihood placement methods? I mean, technically you can, you can run it that way, but you're really uh, violating very sort of deep seated assumptions of these methods. The methods are very much assuming that your sequences have evolved on the reference tree according to a specific model. The reason they, you know, the developers never intended the methods to be used in this way, uh, placing your one, uh, gene sequence data on the species trees. And there is no guarantee that this would work. In fact, it's something we can test, but you know, the, the methods are expected to be sensitive to this violation. Okay, so what's the solution? We thought perhaps this is a problem that can be approached using machine learning. And we think machine learning is a reasonable approach here because we have reference sequences and the tree, right? So, you know, when you think about machine learning, at least supervised machine learning, you always have to think about your training data. And I think in this, in the phylogenetic placement problem, the, it's, you know, we are handed training data sort of in a very natural way. The, the set of reference sequences that you have and the tree that comes with it, that's your training data. What do you want to, uh, what do we want to learn? Well, what I'm hoping that uh, the machine learning will output for us are distances, right? Because we can do placement based on distances. If the machine learning model that we, so let's just train a general purpose model, whatever it is, a neural network or something like that, that given uh, two sequences can give you, uh, can estimate the distance between those sequences. If you can do that, then you can do placement, right? So that's the output you want. And what is our objective here in, in the training process? What we are trying to do is uh, train a model that would give us distances between sequences that best match distances between, uh, sorry, sorry uh, distances on the tree, right? Every two sequence have some distance on the tree. They have, and the model is going to output some distance between them. We want these two distances to, to match. That's our objective. Okay, so let me just say that one more time with a, with a figure, right? So the input is a backbone tree or a reference tree. You can, you know, this tree and a bunch of sequences, the sequences can from, be from a single gene, it could be from a region of a gene, or it could be multiple gene, whatever it is, it does not matter. Uh, the tree also could, be anything. It could be gene tree, a species tree, taxonomic tree. All we assume is that there is a strong, there is some a strong relationship between them. Like the, the tree is not random with respect to sequences. What we want to train is a model. Now the way we do it, uh, it can be in different ways. The way we do it is not to compute distances directly. Instead, this model simply embeds each of the input sequences in a High dimensional Euclidean space, right? So the actual number of dimensions we use in practice are, are in the order of, let's say, uh, tens, right? So tens or maybe hundreds of dimensions. So you take a sequence, you embed it in Euclidean space. And once you have these uh, embeddings in Euclidean space, you can compute distances between uh, embeddings, just Euclidean distances. And those Euclidean distances are, uh, can be fed to apples uh, for, uh, for phylogenetic placement, right? So another way to think about it is that we are really just placing these embeddings uh, using Euclidean distances. Um, okay, so how do we come up with these embeddings? Like what's the training objective here? The objective is this. Our loss function in the training is the, for just take two pairs. So you have a bunch of you know, training sequences. Just take two pairs of them, like like say one pair of them, E1 and E2. Uh, you can compute the Euclidean distance between the embeddings, and you can compute the tree distance between these two uh, uh, you know, species on the reference tree and take its a square root. What we are trying to minimize is the difference between this square root of tree distances and the embeddings in the Euclidean distances. This square root has some theoretical reason 
uh, behind it. Um, I don't want to get into it right now. Uh, so this just becomes very standard training, especially if the model that you are using is something like a neural network. So we designed uh, some neural network. Uh, why exactly this neural network? I have to say there's no like hard and uh, fast uh, reason. Just like everything else in neural networks, we tried a bunch of things and we uh, wind up with some convolutional network, uh, neural network that, that we use. And um, and okay, so we have our model, we, uh, and yeah, the training process to minimize this loss is rather simple at this point, right? You can basically use a standard the stochastic gradient method uh, training to minimize this loss function for the model that you have. So implementing so this whole there, thing becomes uh, standard. Just to double check, so there's, there's nothing really phylogenetic going on in your loss function. No, the loss function does have, so the, the distances, the loss function has the phylogenetic distances as part of it, right? So the right. loss. I guess what I mean is that there's no, like, it's, there's no, I guess there's no placement sort of thing happening. It's, um, you're, you're trying to match these phylogenetic distances. Oh yeah, yeah. the placement is like outside the training, right? So you, you when you're mod, when you're training your model, you're not doing placement per se. You're just getting the best embedding. The placement is, you know, just uh, after that, you know, it's, it's yeah. But, okay. but I don't think there is like theoretically a huge difference because you know, if, to me, distances um, are the same as a phylogy, right? If, if your distances are additive, they are equivalent to a phylogy. Did cool. I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so this is kind of like the process, and um, so let's just look at results and see how it works. So, um, so this particular test again is on that uh, tree with ten thousand uh, species, and uh, what? Uh, so this was the astral tree. We had three hundred eighty genes, ten thousand species, and we tested in two ways. The first way, which is you know from machine learning perspective, is not that interesting. But I think actually from biological perspective, is not it's not not interesting. Is uh, is what happens if you try to place a species that is already in your reference tree, right? So these are these um, uh, triangles. Uh, why do I think it's not completely uh, uninteresting? The reason is you know, you're trying to place uh, something on the species tree given only one gene. Um, now, granted, uh, you have an exact match to it in the tree, but still, I don't think that's, uh, uh, you know, that's a situation that might arise in real applications. In such a scenario, you have perfect uh, accuracy for single copy genes that we had. For a couple of uh, multi-copy genes that we have, we don't have perfect accuracy uh, because it's not always you know, it's not um, simple to distinguish between the copies, but but the error is not so high. Now, of course, as a test, this is not such an interesting test. You never test your method on training data. What you do is you test your uh, method on up, unobserved uh, data. So that's what we call novel queries here, which are these two lines over here. And uh, what we are comparing is placement using simple juice counter distances or placement using uh, yeah, you know, distances that we get from this uh, depth model. And uh, so this is like 5% of the species were left out and they are being placed using a single gene. On the x-axis, you have different genes. As you go from left to right, the genes become more and more similar to the species tree. So the, the number in the parentheses is the discordance of the gene tree to the species tree. We don't use the gene tree, but that's just a discordance to the um, species tree. And so we, what we see here is that there are three genes where I would say that the error is sort of at the levels that it starts to be, become uh, too high. You know, the, the error of six, seven branches on a tree of 10,000, I think that's too high. But uh, but for the remaining uh, genes, the level of error, I think, 
is um, at, at levels that are acceptable for downstream applications. These are what I would say good enough uh, levels of error, especially given what the difficult problem we are trying to solve, right? Uh, uh, adding to a species tree using a single team. So the average error here is about two to two to three edges. Using that, if you were to use juke scan, their distances there would be substantially higher. Okay, so so that's the application. Uh, that that's uh, that's sort of like just accuracy of placement uh, itself. Uh, the y-axis here is how many edges you're away from the correct placement. Now, one of the interesting cases is of course sixteen S, which is what's used in ample consequencing. We can see the error is not too bad here. Is 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 pretty good, uh, but for when people do ample consequencing, they don't have full length 16s uh, gene. Uh, instead, you have uh, you know V3, V4, and if you're you know using one of the um, newer uh, sequencing technology, V plus uh, V3 plus V4, you have you have some sub region. You have you don't have everything. Okay, so what, what's the impact of using subregions with as input to depth? If you had the full lens, this is sort of the error that you would get. So now the error is on the x-axis, the y-axis is just ECDF, right? So what percentage of tests have that much error or lower? And, um, and, and what we see is if we just have V3 and V4 regions, which is 400 base pairs, we don't lose accuracy much. And this is something that can be done uh, with um, sort of amplicon sequence, right? It's, it's pretty good levels of error. If you go to only 150 base pairs, the error does go up substantially. And if you go to 100 base pairs, at this point, you know, the error might be just too much. Like it might, it might be, for a lot of applications, this level of error that you get with 100 base pairs, that might um, not be, uh, uh, you know, accurate enough for those downstream uh, applications. Um, you know, these are the averages that the, the dotted lines is around two person, uh, so, sorry, two edges. Over here, around five edges. Uh, uh, over here. Okay, so it can be done with uh, regions, but not like super short regions. We also tested the method on a much, much smaller data set of simulated, uh, simulated data set, not a uh, real data set. Here, um, you know, gene trees are uh, simulated to be different from each other according to incomplete sorting. We have high levels of discordance on low and medium. Uh, trees are much smaller, only 190 uh, species. Uh, but we were able to also uh, test EPA and G on this data set in addition to apples uh, uh, with the depth distances. And as expected, you know, this again, maximum likelihood is not uh, tested for placing single gene on the species tree. It's not designed for that. And when you test it, it has a very high error. Um, and, and this wasn't so, so surprising to us. What was surprising was at least for low and medium uh, placement, just using juice canter distances and, uh, and distance based placement on the on the species tree wasn't wasn't that bad it was quite it was close to a deep learning method you have to get to high levels of this for this to see a uh, benefit so i guess the the bottom line is these distance-based placements are a little bit more robust it seems to the assumption that sequences have evolved on the tree that you are uh, using Okay, so then it's an there is an interesting question. Why is it that uh, you know, some cases have very, so if you look at these ECDF plots, we have cases of good error, but there is like this tail of cases with very high error, like 15 edges off. That's, that's as good as random at that point. Um, so why is it that sometimes we have these very high uh, levels of error? So we just looked at a you know, bunch of uh, example cases where we have low error. In these cases, we have zero error, and some cases where we have high error. And uh, what we are showing is the true distances versus depth estimates of the distances. The unit line is shown, so you want your distances to be around there. We see that for in training, we get no bias, so that's good. In both cases, um, there is no discernible bias for the training data. For the testing data, there is maybe a little bit of bias towards underestimating distances, not, not a huge bias. 
But really what's different is the amount of variance. So on the left, we have a lot of variance in the training data. On the right, we have very little variance. And this variance relates to signal. Where we have high error, when, uh, you know, when you increase level of discordance to, to ILS, you also uh, decrease the amount of signal because you have to make the branches of the phylogeny shorter. And when you have low signal, you just get a lot of variances in the, in the distances. So this high variance leads to high error. In fact, it's also interesting to just look at the trees. So the red is the query and everything else is the backbone. These numbers are, you know, how much error we have. What you see is that, you know, we have error when we have these long queries that are not similar to anything else. And we have very short branches close to the base of the tree, right? So if you get the distances a little bit off, you can really get uh, uh, far away uh, on the tree, at least based on the number of edges. Cases that are simple or easy are cases where your um, basal branches are longer and you have queries that are similar to your, uh, to your uh, sorry, you have references that are similar to your query. So, yeah, none of this is um, surprising, but it's interesting to see. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the last set of results. Uh, remember I said, if you can solve this problem, one application would be to combine 16S and metagenomic data onto the same tree, right? So you have some species tree as reference, you use your know, depth to add onto it both metagenomic and 16S sample. Does this work in practice? We tested it uh, on, uh, we tested this approach on a data set uh, with you know, 29 individuals, seven, seven of them are controls, 22 have tra uh, traverse the area. And because, okay, so this is the placement tree. The reds are 16S and blue is uh, metagenomic uh, placement. What you can see is uh, some interesting patterns. So, for example, there's some groups that you never find with 16S, but you can find with metagenomic. Uh, if you're placing uh, your, your metagenomic assembled uh, bins, uh, the, the opposite is also true. There are some groups that you only find with 16S. Uh, we believe these are actually spurious. This is a group that is known to be similar to a plant chloroplast that you can find in. You know, people's diet. So we think these are probably spurious placements. And uh, you notice that 16S placements tend to be longer. You can do a statistical test and show that's correct. Um, uh, uh, that's just because you have less signal, things get to be placed more basal when you have less signal. Uh, but there is also quite a bit of agreement between the two. In fact, because everything is added to the same tree, what you can do is do a PCOA analysis. Basically compute the distances between samples on this tree um, uh, using UNIFRAC. So for each individual, we have two dots here. One of them is a circle. The circle is the metagenomic placement and the diamond is the 16S placement. And, and we see mixed pattern here. There are some samples where 16S and metagenomic are giving us extremely uh, sort of consistent uh, uh, views of the microbiome. But there are also some cases like this one where they are very divergent. They are telling us quite a different uh, uh, story. If you can actually do a little bit of a uh, more uh, sort of direct analysis of that pattern. So here for each of the samples, the orange dot is showing the distance from the micro, uh, from the metagenomic sample to the 16S sample of the same individual, whereas the blue dots are showing, for example, that this one is the mean. It's showing the mean distance of the metagenomic sample of a, uh, sorry, metagenomic placement of a sample to 16S placement of other samples, right? So it's, uh, uh, comparing a cross sample. And what you would hope uh, is that everyone's uh, microbiome, everyone's metagenom every sample's metagenomic placement is more similar to its 16S than it is to other samples of 16S. And in most cases we see that, but not always. But an interesting pattern is that 
The similarity between 610S and metagenomic placement increases, in other words, the distance decreases as the coverage of the metagenomic assembly goes up. So metagenomic assembly is not still easy, but right? once you do metagenomic assembly, you might get only 80% of the original reads mapped to something in your uh, assembled genome, uh, uh, genome, or you may get just 10%, right? So when you have, when your metagenome covers a relatively small part of, a small part of your sample, you don't get a tremendous agreement, but the agreement uh, increases as, as, as metagenomic assembly quality goes up. So these are all sort of interesting uh, patterns. We have a bunch of other interesting patterns on this data set I don't have time to go through. Um, I'm, I am technically out of time, but I wanted to just take another two or three minutes to talk about several interesting questions that from my point of view are, un uh, are unanswered about death and should be future work. One is why do we use Euclidean embedding? There is some just, uh, we, we use Euclidean uh, embedding because of a justification that was, that we learned from uh, uh, a paper by you know, John Rhodes and, and, and Layer, where they basically showed that it, the leaves of a tree can always be embedded in uh, Euclidean space of size n minus one. Now in practice, we use far less than n minus one, we use more like the square root of n. But at least this, this was a justification, the theoretical justification. When you do this embedding, you have to use that the square root that I mentioned earlier. But later, we realized that, you know, in theory, a better way to embed leaves of a tree is to use hyperbolic embedding. In theory, you need far fewer dimensions. So that's, uh, and, you know, that's a whole area um, uh, of research these days, hyperbolic neural networks is something that should be tested, uh, hopefully, in the near future. Another answer, another question a lot of people might have is why neural networks, why this uh, you know, a specific loss function? And I have to just basically say there is no hard reason. It's, you know, some of it is trial and error, and it's not even like we did a ton of trial and error. Um, so, you know, this is something that has to be explored, perhaps in theory, perhaps uh, more in practice. There are, you know, interesting things like graph neural networks that uh, would be interesting to, uh, the test as well. And uh, this is the last question, I think the most interesting. Uh, yeah, we showed we can do placement. How about de novo inference? Can we do de novo inference using uh, this methodology there? The answer is not, not, not really because you need training data. And that's what you get in the placement uh, question. But there is some very interesting uh, possibility that we haven't tested, but we should. And it's the following. Um, imagine you have a very complex model of sequence evolution. You have spent a lot of computational resources building a tree with 200 sequences using this model. Now you want to update trees. So you want to basically add new sequences to it, but not in this like one at a time, in, uh, like uh, all of them at the same time independently, but like one at a time, so that you get the relationship between queries. In theory, it, it, it might be possible to use that for this, uh, for this application. And what it will give you is basically you don't have to run these complex models on, on large data sets. It's, 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 it's something very interesting we should test in the future. Uh, let me also mention that using deep learning for de novo reconstruction is something that in the past year, several papers came out on the subject. You heard about one of them last week. There are uh, different ones, different approaches. All of these are, you know, they still have to ask, answer this question. Where do you get the training data? Their answer is uh, using simulation. They, they train based on simulated data, which is something we are trying to uh, avoid. Um, these are references to the papers I mentioned. I, I'll, I'll upload these slides online, you can, you can find them. And I wanted to just mention your know, apples is the work of Mateen Blaban. Um, Dev is the work of the UAU John. The skimmer that I mentioned is the work of Shahab. My or work on apples and dev was in collaboration with Kiwi and Daniel from Arizona State, and the work on the schema was collaboration with Vinny, Tom, and Kristen, and uh, all the stuff there. So yeah, I went a little bit over that. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much, Yvesh. Um So uh, we'd love to hear some questions. Um, 
I actually wrote, I can show you, I wrote down hyperbolic as a question. <laughs> I'm glad I answered that. It's like kind of the hot thing, but it does sort of lead to a couple of questions. So one is when you stare at your embedding, do you see anything interesting? Does it, like you said, you have a 10 dimensional embedding. Does it sort of have some nice tree structure or like, I don't know. I mean, is there anything you can sort of learn by getting that embedding? Um, so we, uh, so I, I have to think about what's the best way to stare at, at them in, in the sense of like what we should look at. But I think this will, um, th this result tell us something interesting, which is um, in the cases where we have a lot of signals, the true distances are matching the distances that we estimated quite well meaning that we are estimating additive distances or, or, or distances that are very close to additive. So they do have a tree structure. Now, our embeddings here are in actually, uh, there's a head, there's a tens. So it's the, I think 64 uh, dimension. We can do like MDS kind of an, uh, analysis or, or I guess PCA analysis and and look at two dimension. Look at the two dimension. If you haven't done that, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. So we do have a, a few questions. I'll ask them in order. So um, is this, namely, the high error versus low error between different tree topologies because classifying happens sooner in the tree? Sure. I think the reason it has a lot to do with uh, two things. One is signal, right? So. Uh, these, so the way these simulations work, we create ILS by making uh, branches shorter. When branches are shorter, you have fewer changes in your sequence. When you have fewer changes, like the true distance doesn't always um, uh, uh, translate to like sequence distances in an obvious way. So that's, so that's the variance here. That's one difficulty. The other difficulty is look at this, for example. This, is, or maybe even the better example is uh, is this one, right? So, so the orange dots are the uh, that is the query distances of the query to the backbone. The minimum true distance to anything in the backbone in this case is close to three million generations. The the unit on the x-axis of generations. So. You know, it was, it's a query that is not similar to anything else in or uh, in our sample. And computing those distances has always been the most difficult. Like these distances are very difficult to, to estimate. In, in, uh, in contrast, these distances are much lower and they are uh, easier to, uh, to, to estimate. So what you can see is that there is like something that is less close uh, in the true distance, but in the estimated distance is, is estimated to have a lower distance, and that will uh, uh, mess up the placement. It's not a very early versus date. There is no early, but like we are not doing a hierarchical classification, so it's not it's not that. Cool. Um, Pierre Barbera asks, uh, thanks for the great talk. I was wondering about the error curve for placement on species trees comparing apples plus depth JC and EPA and JNG. How much ILS was present in the reference tree? Uh, oh, yeah. So, um, so I think you're asking about this. Um, the amount of discordance changes. So here is extremely high. I think it's like 60% RF distance between the species tree and gene tree. Here is not quite as high. I'm um, struggling to remember the exact number, but I want to say it's around like 20% or, uh, or, or, or 80 percent, something around that. I have, I think, the actual number in the paper. Uh, but there is substantial Maybe you can follow up later. I, uh, um, oh, he's got it here. Wow. Yeah, so it's about 20%. Uh, so in the low, low discordance is 20%, high discordance is about 70%. So we have, wow. we have to that. that's, that's pretty high discordance. Um, I mean, and it's like, so I guess the ILS thing, there is still sort of a well-defined uh, species tree, but in the metagenomic case, there's sort of not. Uh, and you're still sort of, and, and I think it's a, like my mind was like, boom, when you were saying, hey, can we get species replacement with a discordant gene tree? That's a super cool idea. 
but still, I mean, there's some inherent limitations to this, right? Like, and so, like, what what could you do? I mean, could you sort of identify multiple tree-like signals and then try to find the one? Like, if you have a query, then it sort of spit, fits in this particular tree. I don't know. I think that's, that's, that's a very problem. interesting question. So I have thought about that a little bit. Here is uh, here's the way I'm thinking about it. So if what you have is horizontal gene transfer as opposed to ILS, which is what we have in these data sets, right? And by the way, these are the quartet similarities between gene tree and the species tree. So you can see like there is, with some of these gene trees, quartet score, quartet score of 66% uh, is random tree. And this is like 59. So there, <laughs> this is not low discordance either. But uh, by the way, back to your question, then you have horizontal gene transfer. The way I think about it is this, if, your query has a horizontally transferred gene. Uh, let's say it's, it's horizontally transferred for the gene you are using for placement that we have never seen. We have never seen that horizontal transfer in the training data. I think that hopeless. I don't think this kind of approach that we are using right now would be able to overcome that because, you know, for all, everything it has in, uh, seen in the training data would say a sequence that looks like this would belong here, right? But all of a sudden this, this horizontal transfer, it has never seen that and it will become problematic. However, if in your training set, you have seen similar horizontal transfer, and by that I mean horizontal transfer that is a little bit more basal to your query sequence, and is shared between your query sequence and some other uh, sequences in the reference, then I don't think it's hopeless because the model has an opportunity to learn that, oh, look, when the sequence looks like this, uh, you know, it should be embedded closer, not to these sequences, but to those other parts of the tree. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, I mean, but that's, yeah. Yeah, that but, but uh, you're right that there is a limitation, which is horizontal gene transfer that has not, that is sort of not uh, more basal to your query and some observed sequences, that I think is a hopeless case. And those are the ones that are giving us the high level of error, I think. But it's, but even if they're, yeah. I think the answer might become eventually, it's a cop out, but a lot, a lot of things in machine learning, it might be just the more we get into our reference trees the more likely it is that um, we are, we are going to have seen that pattern of horizontal transfer before. Now, maybe there is another clever way to get around it. I, I haven't been able to pick up anything. OK, a few. This is maybe just a quick question. Uh, based on what you said about 16S, I guess you recommend always performing assembly instead of using sequencing reads to place directly. Uh, oh, no, no, no. I, I wouldn't say uh, we, uh, we, we recommend that. This is just what we tested, uh, we, we haven't really got around testing, uh, placing reads individually. There is a trade-off. I mean, it's obvious that if you're just placing one read at a time, you're gonna have lower uh, accuracy per read. But of course you have a lot more read. And if you are combining the results in a smart way, perhaps you can get better result. I, I'm not claiming that that pipeline is less accurate. We, we haven't tested that. I, I actually feel it might be more accurate if you can do that combined step in a smart in a way. One more question. Yeah, how, uh, what computational resources would I need to train the model for each gene tree, 7,000 proteins per tree? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the answer is you need a GPU, of course, and that's sort of a modern GPU. Um, if you have one, it's not too slow. So for 10,000, um, we have the numbers in the paper. Um, I, I want to say it was a matter of uh, hours. Um, um, I, uh, there you go. Uh, it to, uh, 20 minutes, not even hours. So, so training takes around uh, 20 minutes. And, uh, oops, sorry, no, this is a small bit. Uh, uh, sorry, 140 minutes, yeah. So it's around like two, three hours uh, on a 
not even the latest GPU, but uh, quite a, a strong GPU. You do need GPUs, though. Cool. I guess uh, uh, going back to my my sort of clarification question during your talk, I, I, I wish that one could learn learn the distance at the same time that you're learning, like learn the, the loss function somehow. The, the true loss function that you care about is the placement level loss function, not the distance level loss function. So that gives you some sort of flexibility. Like, is there some way that you could learn, like what is the best embedding plus loss function that you could have for creating that embedding to get your eventual goal, which is the placement? Yeah, yeah, I think we, we, we started thinking that way, right? Um, and um, and I think it, there there might be, um, so I, now I understand, I, I don't think I understood exactly what your question was before, now I understand it. So, so basically, you know, you can add this whole thing to the training process and, and measure the placement error as your loss function. So I have two thoughts on that. One is that, if distances are uh, additive for your team, then then of course your placement error will be zero. We can guarantee that, right? And or or if they are like close closer to additivity than like a certain situation. So so that makes me at least a little bit more uh, happy about like the way we are doing it. But um, yeah, so if you want to do the placement with um, you know, if you want to do the placement as part of the training, it will, you know, we don't have this nice grid. So like here, because we don't have anything discrete, everything is in Euclidean spaces. Training process itself is very a standard, right? You just do the standard stuff. If you are doing placement as part of it, you get into discrete spaces and you can take gradients and the whole thing becomes more challenging. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be solved, but if, it's not quite as simple um, as as training that we have. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I guess though. I mean, you you've said if your tree is additive a couple times, and that's sort of. <laughs> I feel a little bit like uh, the distance. Yeah. So I mean, the, like the sequence distances, of course, are not additive, right? So, so what I'm talking about, like, are the embeddings, right? So the, yeah. the whole point is that the the embeddings. Do or it can become very very close to additive if, if you have signal. So I'm uh, so when I talk about additive, just just a clarification. I'm talking about the yeah the embedding yeah distances. But but you're right. I mean there is, and there is another thing that you can uh, do even before that is like we are not even outputting distances directly. We are outputting embedding. So. One thing that can be done is to train these models in a way that output distances directly instead of doing embeddings, right? Um, and and define a loss function on that. Um, yeah, all of this I think is to be explored. This is sort of like a first step in this framework. I think I think a better system can definitely be built. I, and I. I... I feel like there's also, there is some literature, I feel like from Leo Pactor or someone in that circle that like using multiple distances as part of a distance based, like using multiple distance matrices as part of uh, a distance based phylogenetic inference algorithm. Um, and I just sort of wonder if you could sort of just enrich your current approach with something like that. And I, maybe I'll just have to dig that up. If That's very interesting. I have to I have to look at it. I guess I'm not familiar with that, uh, that work. I'll tell you what we do right now, which is very very heuristic. Um, but I, I need to look at what you're talking about. So now imagine instead of one gene, you do have like I don't know, ten gene or twenty genes. Uh, how can you use this? Of course, you can just concatenate them. That's one thing. Uh, the better approach we have found is you train a model per gene. Um, that's easier to do anyway. And then now you get a bunch of distances back, and we just summarize those distances by taking sort of the average after removing outliers, something like that. Um, that's like a very heuristic way of doing it. If there is a more 
Um, I'll, I'll have to look at Lior's work on this to see if there's any more sort of fun, fundamentally, um, I guess, justified way to, to, to summarize. Anyway, cool work. Uh, thanks for that. And um, thanks for the yeah. invitation. Yeah, and next time we will have someone trying the somewhat crazy thing of uh, actually trying to be able to back pop through trees, which is, uh, as you mentioned, like kind of a challenge. So we'll see how that goes. All right, thanks, Yavash. Thank you. Bye.